So far, we've learned about analyzing a poem's dramatic situation, contemplating both the theme and things like who is speaking and who's being spoken to, and the action and the setting of the poem, and the poem's form and structure, the kind of poem it is, and the different structural and organizational elements like stanzas, rhyme scheme, and meter. Remember that with textual explication, you start with the biggest pieces and work your way down to the smallest. This third video will explore those smallest elements, the ways in particular that language is used to create patterns throughout the poem. Before we get to the real specifics of the language, we have one other transitional aspect to consider. We've talked about looking at the stanzic structure of the poem, but we also want to look at the ways the lines are arranged. Lines and line breaks are one thing that clearly separate poetry from other forms of literature. When we think about the way a poet has broken down the lines of a poem, we are talking about the poem's lineation. But lineation is more than just about line breaks. It's also about, and maybe more importantly about, the pauses the poet wants you to take when reading the poem. Remember that when you read a poem, whether out loud or in your head, you do not automatically pause at the end of every line. That's something we inherently want to do often, since it seems to make sense visually, but you should only pause when reading a poem when there is some kind of punctuation that forces you to pause. Listen again to the first four lines, the first quatrain of Claude McKay's If We Must Die, and pay attention to when and why I'm pausing. If we must die, let it not be like hogs hunted and penned in an inglorious spot while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. What's the common factor when I, for when I paused? That's right, the commas. Whether reading poetry or prose, we also take a short pause for a comma. So how do we describe the lineation of this first quatrain? If a line of poetry ends with some kind of punctuation, we say that that line is end-stopped. Which lines in that quatrain are end-stopped? Right, two, three, and four. If a line of poetry does not end with any kind of punctuation, we say that the line is enjammed. We can see an example of enjambment with line one of If We Must Die. If a line of poetry has a grammatical pause in the middle of the line, we call that a caesura. Where do we see a caesura in this quatrain? Right again, in line one we have a pause created by the comma in the middle of that line. When you're reading poetry, and especially when you're analyzing poetry, pay particular attention to those pauses and ask yourself why the poet wants you to pause there. Is the poet calling our attention to something immediately after that pause? Next, we want to think about how the language is being used to appeal to our senses. Imagery, symbolism, and figurative language offer a variety of ways for any writer, whether through poetry or prose, to appeal to our senses and call attention to something significant. These are the types of literary devices you probably have some familiarity with, and they're the kinds of things we will explore throughout this semester. For the sake of brevity, let's quickly differentiate between some of these. Imagery is a literary device that appeals directly to our senses. Sight, sound, smell, touch, or taste. A symbol is something that functions on two levels in the literary text. A symbol has to have a physical presence in the text. It has to actually exist in the world of the text. But a symbol also functions on the symbolic level. It has a significantly higher meaning. If you've read The Scarlet Letter, you're very aware of symbols. Hester actually wears that A on her chest. It's physically present, but at the same time, much of the story is devoted to exploring what greater meaning that red letter actually suggests. An allusion is a brief reference to some other text, another literary work, a religious story, mythology, etc. Allusions are not explained or explored in detail. They are often little hints that the reader either gets or does not get right away. The illusion adds an additional context through which the reader can consider the text. Figurative language is a broad term that includes a variety of linguistic tricks to manipulate language and create a greater meaning. You're likely familiar with many of these. Metaphors, similes, personification are the most commonly known types of figurative language. But there are others we'll want to consider. Finally, we want to consider how the poet is using and manipulating sounds throughout the poem. Here again, we want to look 
especially for patterns. We've already talked in the previous video about end rhymes and how they create structure, but poets can also employ internal rhymes, rhymes that occur within the line of poetry. When considering rhymes, we need to be aware that not all rhymes are the same. The rhymes you're most used to are probably perfect rhymes, when two words have the exact same final pairing of vowel and consonant, bake and wake, for example. Some rhymes, though, have similar but not identical end sounds. Sometimes the poet decides close enough is good enough. Heavy and spaghetti, for example. These can also be called half rhymes or slant rhymes. Some poets will play a visual trick by using an I, E-Y-E, -E, rhyme. I rhymes are those pairings of words in the English language that look alike but are pronounced differently. Prove and love, for example, look like they should rhyme. Even smaller than rhymes, we want to consider the repetition of individual sounds. Most people are familiar with alliteration when the same consonant sound is repeated. Who watches the watchers has that repetition of the W sound. Similar to alliteration, we also have consonants and assonants. Consonance occurs when the poet uses words with the same pattern of consonant, but different vowels. For example, pitter, patter. Assonance is the repetition of the same vowel sound within a series of words. In the statement, the early bird catches the worm, we get the soft E sound three times. Okay, once again, that's a lot of information in a small amount of time. A lot of this also is also described in the handout from class, which is meant to be kind of cheat sheet for you. There's a lot to look for when analyzing poetry. Keep thinking about it in terms of that inverted triangle, though, to remember that you are continually looking at smaller and smaller pieces of these poetic puzzles. Thanks, as usual. Be sure to complete the short video quiz, too, on Blackboard before class.